So recently I announced that I am getting ready to build an experimental aircraft and I'm super excited to share that process with you all, but I wanted to stop before I go into the details on what aircraft I picked as well as really just starting to share the uh, build series on that and talk about what experimental aircraft is. So we're going to talk about uh, what's the difference between an experimental aircraft and something that's certified like my Cessna 140 back here. We're going to talk about why I wanted to go experimental and then in the next video we're going to talk about which kit I picked and why. So make sure you stick around for that. Let's jump into it. What's the difference between experimental and certificated aircraft? The EAA states that there are 33,000 aircraft that meet the category of a amateur built or home built aircraft. But let's first start off with what really the differences are for general aviation aircraft. And the first thing is the airworthiness certificate. So as all of us know, a certified aircraft, or really any aircraft before you fly, you've got to verify that you've got your airworthiness certificate registration operators, you know, limitations, uh, um, the handbook, whether it's an AFM or a POH, as well as the weight and balance for that aircraft. Aircraft like my Cessna 140 have a standard airworthiness certificate, meaning that they can be in those categories of normal, utility, aerobatic, things like that, transport category. And the way that that certificate is issued is to a manufacturer who uh, predetermines that they're going to build that aircraft in accordance to uh, basically set limitations. There's only a couple types of engines that the Cessna 140 was certified to have on it. So it's very limited in that option. And those engines only had a certain number of propellers that could be associated with them. It was things that the manufacturer went to the FAA and said, look, we've tested this, we know this will work. And the FAA gives a stamp of approval that says, okay, you can build that aircraft to that specification. Those specs, by the way, are referred to as a type certificate data sheet. It's kind of, it's not really like the birth certificate. It's more like the blueprint of what that aircraft should look like. When they build that, then the airworthiness certificate can get issued to that uh, manufacturer for the aircraft. It never expires and it's valid as long as the aircraft meets its type design and meets the inspections per whatever regulatory part it flies under. Experimental aircraft, however, fall under what's referred to as a special airworthiness certificate. These are issued for aircraft that have a special purpose. These include your primary, restricted, limited, LSA, provisional, and experimental aircraft. And each of these has a specific purpose or reason to exist. For example, your restricted category includes a lot of your ag tractors. So crop spraying aircraft that are out there, you know, keeping uh, the breadbasket of uh, America supported. Those aircraft are typically inside of a restricted category. It can also be used for things like weather control. So cloud seeding aircraft, quite often, if they're not military, fall under the category of a restricted category aircraft because it's been modified for that purpose. Typically your aerial advertisement like banner towing falls inside of restricted although there can be some experimental aircraft, really any aircraft can tow banners, um, but because of the nature of that those are usually operated under a restricted certificate or restricted airworthiness. The limited category is very useful for your warbird community because many of those military aircraft like C-47s, um, things like that, that are now operated by civilian operators. They were military aircraft, and to do that, they are put into the limited category. Not always, but often, they fall inside of that limited category certificate as a special airworthiness certificate. That being said, by far the largest special airworthiness certificate is the experimental aircraft. By definition, an experimental aircraft is an aircraft that doesn't have a type certificate or does not conform to its type certificate but is still safe for operation. This includes several things like test aircraft, for which there is no type certificate yet. Anytime that you're testing a new modification in pursuit of a field approval, it usually puts the aircraft into a experimental category, even though it may be manufactured. Uh, exhibition, like a movie or an air show, sometimes those will be experimental. Aircraft that are involved in air racing, think like the, the old Reno air races. And then finally, the amateur or kit built aircraft, your home builds, like I'll be doing over the next few years on this channel. So while we're talking about experimental aircraft, there's really several types of experimental aircraft 
that exist that are out there today. And the first one is referred to as a home built. Now here's some like, I don't know if it's technical definitions or just industry definitions, but a home built is anything that I think of it as a one-off. Um, there's nothing like it out there. There's only one of them that exists. So, you know, multiple home builds could be done. And a great example is here local for me, right up the road in Lebanon, Tennessee, Valaire Avionics has a two-third scale P38 Lightning. It, I think it's technically a TPP38. Mr. Bill Pressler, who's the owner of that company, uh, a relative of his years ago, took the plans for P38, scaled them down to two-thirds size, and really built the aircraft around um, the cabin area for him and his wife and uh, made this one of a kind, nobody else has one of these aircraft. He, he meticulously designed, tested, you know, went through all the structural integrity of that to design that aircraft and created it out of nothing. Um, really just from his mind, he developed that aircraft. That would be technically, that's what a home built is. Something that somebody just builds at home or, or that's the idea that they would build it themselves. It takes an enormous amount of planning and a strong background in aircraft design and flight characteristics to be able to do that. So very few people really should even attempt a home build, designing something on their own and tackling that. Now the second type is a plan built. So some people who do those home builds, they come up with a design that's so good or so popular that they actually develop it into what's referred to as a plan build. So a plan build has some structure to it. Um, it's able to have blueprints and designs to where you know anybody can take that and from scratch then with those plans, build an aircraft. This is more common than a home built, um, but maybe still not the most common way of building a experimental aircraft. So your first type is to build from scratch, a one-off. The second type is to buy plans or get plans from someone who has built this aircraft before and then created the blueprints or the specs for you to take and go design the aircraft from um, scratch materials. But now you have the design that you're gonna follow. These typically take multiple years, many times decades, uh, cause you got not to only acquire all the material, like the raw tubing and weld that together, uh, the raw uh, sheet metal and assemble all of that. But then you've also got to build up a tool inventory to manufacture all that. Uh, many times to do a plans build, you've got to build a jig to make your aileron. You've got to build a jig just to make your ribs for the wings um, because you're going to be punching out or folding up a bunch of those as well. So those can often take uh, a ton of time to do. Now the third type, and I think I would say this is probably the most popular type nowadays. I don't know that I could point to a statistic and prove that. But the third type, and it's also the type that I selected, is a quick build kit. Uh, many times you've heard the 51% the rule to where the builder has to do at least 51% of the aircraft for it to be considered an experimental aircraft rather than a manufactured aircraft by a company. And it is kind of like blending a certified aircraft and an experimental aircraft. So when I purchased my kit, which I look forward to telling you about why I selected the kit I selected next time, I looked at a kit that had a major portion of the components already assembled and completed before I even received it. That's going to save me over a thousand hours of operating and manufacturing parts and, and welding and, and very complex processes that the builder of my kit could do and then send it to me for really the, the final assembly of that. I'm still doing 51% of it. I'm, I mean, I'm still doing fabric. I'm still hanging the engine. I'm still, you know, painting the aircraft. I'm still really riveting and assembling a lot of the wings and putting stuff into the wings. I'm still developing and working on the fuel tanks and stuff like that. So there's a ton of work, probably 1,500 hours worth of work that I'll have to do to get my aircraft to the stage where it can be test flown. But I'm saving time by buying a quick build kit. And I actually look forward to sharing some of the cost versus time that I will be saving in that next video. So make sure you stick around for that. One of the highest profiles kit builders that I've recently seen is Carson Stilson or Wearworthy on Instagram and YouTube, who just finished his Zenith CH750 Super Duty Whiskey Neat. And lastly, if money is not an issue or you are just absolutely clueless when it comes to mechanical stuff, 
More and more companies are offering what's referred to in some manner as a build assist or a factory build for their aircraft to where you show up at set intervals four or five times for a period of five days or so. And instead of you having to acquire all the tools and organize the hardware, which for me, the hardest thing so far has been to make sure everything is organized, label, and I can find stuff when I finally get to that point to where I need it. But you can do a factory assistance and that allows the owner to show up and complete 51% of their build inside the manufacturing facility. Well, think about it. Like I said, you don't need the tools, but you've also got the expertise of the person who can build one of these and has probably built multiple of these aircraft standing right there telling you what to do. Not only do they know what to do, they know the shortcuts. They know the pitfalls. So you're not going to learn probably as much on that. You know, like I'll be learning as I build, but it's a huge asset to individuals who have no mechanical background to build one of those or just have the money to go ahead and knock that out. So the obvious benefit to this is you don't really have to know how to do anything or understand why you're doing it. You're just listening to someone tell you what to do and you can build your own airplane. Uh, it's way simpler than a plans build and even a, uh, simpler than a kit like I'm doing, but it can cost anywhere from an additional 50 to $100,000 depending on the kit, just because you are paying for that expertise. A couple examples of builders that have recently been doing these factory assist or build series would be Josh and Chelsea, who are building out in California on their Sling TSI, as well as Aaron and Paul, who just finished their Bearhawk 5 at the Fairview, Oklahoma facility for the Bearhawk aircraft. So why experimental? Well, a lot of people choose to build their own plans aircraft because if you do build that aircraft, then you can apply for and become uh, the repairman for it. Really, you are allowed to do that. Um, automatically. And what that means is instead of an annual inspection, experimental aircraft are given what is known as a condition inspection. An annual inspection is designed to look at an, a certified aircraft like my Cessna 140 and say it conforms to its type certificate and its airworthiness and all the airworthiness directives that go on to or that apply to that aircraft. But a experimental aircraft, I mean there may only be if you do a home built one of your aircraft. There is no type certificate for it to conform to. So instead of an annual, at the same interval of 12 calendar months, experimental aircraft are required to do what's called a condition inspection. It's just to verify that they're in a safe condition for flight. In the scope of it, it's basically an annual inspection, except airworthiness directives don't apply because it is an experimental aircraft. And the operator can perform that themselves if they built the aircraft. Now Mosaic actually just changed this, which is really awesome to where if you go do a course, even though you may not have built your own aircraft, if you're the owner of the aircraft on the registration, you can do your own condition inspection. This is gonna be a huge asset to owners and I really think we're about to see a huge explosion in popularity of experimental aircraft because of A, how Mosaic has just changed stuff and B, just that simple fact that they can do their own condition inspections. Be anywhere from two to $3,000 just for a routine annual. But I'm an AMP with an IA. I don't need that. So why am I doing an experimental aircraft? If you go to Barnstormers, Trade a Plane, even Facebook Marketplace, and you start looking around at aircraft for sale, you're gonna see that the current valuation and price of aircraft has doubled in the last five to 10 years. Actually, it's a known fact that every 10 years, the cost of building or manufacturing an aircraft doubles. It's just inflationary data. Um, it's going to double every 10 years. And, and it's, I can attest to that. I know what I bought my Cessna 144 about 15 years ago, and now that aircraft is more than double in its value, and it's not a great platform. It's, you know, it's just, I would say like an average, it's not a show plane is what I'm trying to say. So sometimes an aircraft can become so costly to keep and maintain, like for example, airworthiness directives. There's several wing spar ADs that have, think of the Cessna 177, the Cardinal, that can become really the value of the aircraft to replace that component or to do the inspection as the AD requires. So there's huge cost and hidden costs that can just pop out of nowhere associated with a certified aircraft. But why is that the case? Why does that exist? 
Well, it all boils down to the FAA's manufacturing and parts creation process. It is incredibly hard nowadays for a manufacturer to get approved to make a part. So if you have not already received one, the FAA is very uncooperative about helping a developer to manufacture a, a approved part that's got a stamp on it that says PMA approved or parts manufacturing authorization, meaning that that company has the ability to manufacture that part and to distribute it for a specific type of aircraft. Well, that means that the cost of those parts are going up. And because of logistical or basically people suing each other, insurance has gone up, the parts continue to rise, parts availability continues to decrease, because if the manufacturer were to mass produce parts, their cost would go down, the manufacturer would make less money. So it's actually in their favor to do on-demand parts manufacturing sometimes, which is incredibly expensive. One of the sad things about that is, you know, there are generators and parts that go on my Cessna 140 that if I go to Aircraft Spruce and I buy them from Spruce, not because it's Spruce, but because it's an FAA approved part, that part will cost anywhere from two to four times as much as if I just go down to Napa Auto Parts and pick that part up off the shelf. And sometimes it's the exact same model number. It's just not an FAA approved part. And that all has to do with the rigor of the testing, and I understand that. I understand why the FA has that. I'm not saying that it shouldn't be that way. I'm just simply giving a motivation for why I wanna do what I wanna do. Because those parts for that certified aircraft have to have a PMA stamp on them, there are parts that are higher quality that I do not have access to for my Cessna 140. I am not allowed to put a superior part onto the aircraft just because it's not been approved for it. That's not the case with my experimental aircraft. If I find that there's a improvement in the fuel line, for example, if I don't want to use a solid line and I ended up deciding to use a braided metal line that's got flex and give to it a little bit, I can install that on the aircraft, no problem. Like there's no reason why I can't do that because it's experimental. That's one of the reasons I want to go experimental is I want the ability to modify the aircraft and put improvements on it as well as just do cool stuff. I'm thinking about a lot of stall, short takeoff and landing modifications that I want to do to an aircraft that's already kind of designed for that to improve its takeoff and landing performance, not only in and out of my strip, but in a future goal that I have with the aircraft. So the first one is cost. The second one is really the ability to modify the aircraft. And then the last one is it just intrigues me. When I was a kid, my youth pastor and I at church designed from a popular mechanics magazine article, a glider that we continued to modify. You know, I, I had the ability to look at rib designs, um, you know, as a 12 year old kid, trying to figure out what would be most ideal for that glider. I learned a lot about stability and control, trying to design that glider with horizontal stab placement and CG placement. I even learned about wing load and the structural integrity. You know, how do I make it strong without making it too large? So I never built that glider, but we spent, I probably spent hundreds of hours working on the design project for that. And this is gonna kind of be a little bit of a fulfillment for me to get to finally do that and be able to say, I built this airplane. And I look forward to sharing that process with you all over the next several years. But more importantly, I'm looking forward to this as a family project. My wife and kids have already been helping me with this. I want them to grow up having the experience of putting together and building this kit plane and then potentially getting their certificates in the aircraft if they're interested in becoming pilots. And I just want them to have a little bit of a mechanical background where they know how to use a screwdriver, use a wrench. They're familiar with things like that and to give them some mechanical inclination through this project with me. And so I'm torn because I want to build this as efficiently and as fastly as possible, but at the same time, I'm gonna enjoy the process. I don't know how long that's going to take. My target right now is two years. It may drag on to be double that, and that's okay. It'll be fine if it does. But I look forward to next time sharing kind of what kit I selected, why I selected it, and then the build process from there on. 
Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this and I hope you understand experimental aircraft a little bit more. And I'd be very curious if any of you have actually built an experimental aircraft to get just some kind of straw poll in the comments on whether you did a plans or I would love to know if you've actually done a true home build to where you build a one of a kind aircraft. I'll catch you in the next video. Have a great rest of your day.